is the source of evil. The hearts and blackened souls of men. Or something more arcane, greater and sinister. the devil, Mephistopheles, Satan, Beelzebub, and his army of demons have held mankind in their grasp for thousands of years. Tonight, we look at the instances where this extreme evil has risen from the fiery domain of hell to become a member of the monsters. In 1486, a Catholic clergyman, Heinrich Kramer, writes the Maleus Maleficarum, a tome on demonology and witchcraft. There is in them a natural madness, a wanton fantasy, as is seen in their spiritual sense of pride, envy, and wrath. For this reason, they are the enemies of the human race, rational in mind, but reasoning without words, Subtle in weaknesses, eager to hurt, ever fertile in fresh deceptions. They change the perceptions and befoul the emotions of men. They confound the watchful and in dreams disturb the sleeping. They bring diseases, stir up tempests, disguise themselves as angels of the light, bear hell always about them. From witches, they usurp to themselves the worship of God and by this means magic spells are made. They seek to get a mastery over the good and molest them to the most of their powers. To the elect they are given as temptation, and always they lie in wait for the destruction of men. Demon are more than an extension of Satan himself. They are his agents in the spiritual world and on earth, forever tempting us to evil and the darkness. Though they weren't always evil. The ancient Greeks had their daemon, benevolent spirits who assist the living, akin to the guardian angels of Christianity. Around 8th century BC, Hesiod writes of them as kindly, haunting earth guardians of mortal men who, I ween, watch the decisions of justice. And they counted 30,000 in the ranks of man. These daemon serve man after living as noble, good-willed men themselves. The daemons also serve specific gods. A duality is formed by the Hellenistic Greeks, who split daemons into dualistic categories. Agatha daemon for good, and Kako daemon for bad. Mythological figures often combine the characteristics of men with animals, in such creatures as the Minotaur, or the playful satyrs of Greek myth, with cloven hooves, horns, and the lower body of goats, the satyr resembles the Christian notion of a demon. The term demon in the New Testament of the Bible is misconstrued as the decidedly evil demon. In the book of Genesis, God creates the world in six days, ending it with the creation of man and woman who live in the paradise of Eden. Adam and Eve are forbidden to eat from the tree of knowledge. A serpent tempts Eve with an apple from the tree, which she and Adam eat. As a result of going against God's wishes, they are expelled from Eden. Later, their son Cain murders his brother Abel, and as the first murderer, he is cursed by God to wander the earth. Some Jewish texts 
view Cain's evil as not coming from man, but from Eve's mating with either the serpent from the garden or the devil itself. In the Hebrew Bible, Adam is granted a wife before Eve, named Lilith, who is cast out of Eden after refusing to be subservient. A Kabbalistic approach to Lilith is as a succubus, or a demon who mates with men. Lilith mates with man to create half-human, demon hybrids, seducing him as he dreams. When there is a war in heaven, one of God's brightest angels, Lucifer, leads a rebellion. He and his followers are soon cast out by God. Over time, Lucifer, Satan, and Beelzebub all become general names for the devil, God's counterpart in the kingdom of hell. He rules over tortured souls in an afterlife of torture with his own demon army. When Italian poet Dante Alighieri writes his allegorical Inferno, it is just as much a criticism of Italy's political past as an epic poem. Inferno follows Dante's tour of the nine circles of hell as he is led by the ghost of the Roman poet, Virgil. It is in the ninth and final ring that Dante and Virgil encounter the king of hell. He is a king trapped by his own kingdom. Upon his fall from heaven, he lands and is encased in ice up to his chest. This Satan is three-headed, with each mouth devouring a legendary traitor. Judas, who betrayed Christ, Caius Cassius, and Marcus Brutus, both of whom betrayed and murdered Julius Caesar. There lives a German alchemist in the 1500s, one whose name will go down in infamy alongside that of the devil. His name is Johann Georg Faust. The first documentation of his name is in a letter from an abbot to an astronomer on August 20th, 1507. The man of whom you wrote to me, who has dared to call himself the prince of necromancers, is a vagabond, vain dabbler, and vagrant, who deserves to be chastised, that he may not henceforth venture to publicly profess principles odious and contrary to the holy church. He is reported to have said, in the presence of several bystanders, that the miracles of our Savior Christ were not to be wondered at, as he could perform the same miracles when and wherever he pleased. While it is impossible to know the full facts behind the life of Faust, he is regularly referred to in letters in a less than favorable light. Theologian Johann Gast. He led about with him a dog and a horse, devils in my opinion, who were ready to obey his orders. Certain persons assured me that the dog sometimes took the form of a servant and brought him his food. Faust dies in 1540. Gast blames it on an encounter with the devil himself at the inn where the alchemist stayed. The wretched man had a sad end, for the devil strangled him, and his corpse, though placed five times on the back, always turned over again with the face downward. Faust's legend is cemented decades later, when, in 1587, an anonymous author pens the small book Historia von D. Johann Fausten, apparently called from Faust's own papers. Historia reveals that Faust, enchanted by the occult, sought the devil. Faust goes to a crossroads in the forest of Spesserwald near Wittenberg. He draws circles in the ground beneath him with his staff and between nine and 10 o'clock conjures the devil. There is a storm, but Faustus stays strong. Then a dragon hovers above him and fire descends from the sky. All of these things Faustus endures. 
by midnight, a devil appears in the form of a gray friar, and Faustus commands him to return to him the next morning. Eventually, a deal is struck with the devil, Mephistopheles. Faustus will receive unlimited power under the conditions that... I do promise him in return that when I be fully sated of that which I desire of him, 24 years also being passed, ended, and expired, he may at such a time and in whatever manner or vice pleases him, order, ordain, reign, rule, and possess all that may be mine, body, property, flesh, blood, etc., herewith duly bound over in eternity and surrendered by covenant in mine own hand by authority and power of these presents, as well as of my brain, intent, blood, and will. I now defy all living beings, all the heavenly host, and all mankind, and this must be. In confirmation and contract thereof, I have drawn out my own blood for certification in lieu of a seal. Twenty-four years later, Faustus pleads with God to forgive him and save him from the devil. After midnight, a storm comes, centered only on the inn of Faustus and his students. A hideous music and weak and hollow cries emanate from Faustus's quarters. The next morning, his students discover something far more terrifying than earlier reports. Blood covers the parlor. Bits of brain cling to the walls where the devil had dashed his head. Faustus's eyes lay separate and unseeing on the floor, and his teeth are broken from his jaw. His head and limbs, when they find them, still twitch. Reports soon abound of Faustus's ghost haunting the inn, walking the halls, and peering out of windows. In 1604, English dramatist Christopher Marlowe adapts the Faust legend as his play, The Tragical History of the Life and Death of Dr. Faustus. Marlowe's Faust makes a deal with Lucifer through his servant, Mephistopheles. There exist two versions, one in which his friends find only his clothes laying about, and another where Faustus is carried off by demons, his fate waiting off stage for him. Marlowe's play may not have been huge in England, but it is a hit when it arrives in Germany. In the 1700s, something unusual happens. It becomes a puppet play. The next version of the Faust legend comes from German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He is only 23 in 1772, having just finished university, when he is first inspired to translate the tale. For him, Faust is a staple of his childhood, acted out by marionettes. Returning to Frankfurt, Goethe pens his first drama, Goethe von Berlichingen, and his short novel, the Sorrows of Young Werther, both cement him as a literary figure in the making. He begins writing Faust, part one. It proves to be only an early version, now known as Ur Faust. In 1794, he muses on his abandoned project. I cannot make up my mind to untie the packet in which it is imprisoned. I could not copy without working it out and I have no courage for that. Three years later, Goethe revisits Faust, part one, and completes it in 1808. He later seals up the finished part two and decrees that none shall read it until his own eyes are closed, forever. Goethe dies on March 22nd, 1832. His two-part Faust lives on, released posthumously. Faust Part One focuses on Faust's thirst for knowledge, that only magic surpasses the limitations of academia, 
and his downfall in pursuing the arcane through his deal with Mephistopheles. Unlike the real-life Johann Faust, Goethe's Heinrich Faust is able to redeem himself and escapes the devil's grasp to ascend to heaven. Heavy metal and demon mythology work together like chocolate and peanut butter. Uh, the heavy metal genre is constantly having to up the ante to keep their fans happy with louder guitars, faster drums, and heavier riffs. They also need to fill the songs with lyrics of horror and uh, darkness to keep the fans happy. So, naturally, dipping into stories of subjects like Amodius, Faust, and Lilith would just make sense. So bands like Deicide, Morbid Angel, and Absu have definitely been telling these stories of blood and horror for as long as they've had a, a career going. Uh, heavy metal definitely is music for teenagers and adolescents, and uh, that time there's a lot of push and pull between the uh, young man, young women, and their parents. Um, this chasm might be, let's say, widened by the influence of heavy metal. Good or bad, the black clothing and pagan iconography will definitely cause a parent to fret about little Janie or Johnny's whereabouts on a Friday night when they're going to the Deicide concert. And if they bother to look in, at the lyrics inside the album, they might just realize that they're looking at tales straight out of the Bible. A lot of people like to believe that the devil himself helps these bands pen their songs. Uh, well, that might not be true. They definitely use a lot of the devil's work as source materials. If the devil is one with many names, his demons are plenty, and as such, have their own classifications. Perhaps most chilling are the incubi and succubi, demons that mate with humans while they sleep. Are incubi and succubi real? There are some accounts that dictate so. The Hollinshead Chronicles of 1577 tells of a Scottish ship caught in a violent storm. A female passenger, fearing herself the cause, confesses to an affair with an incubus. To save the ship, she says, she needs to be thrown overboard. As a shipboard's priest performs an exorcism, which is a rite to cleanse the ship of evil influence, the demon issues forth from the ship's pump. The incubus is described as a foul and evil-flavored black cloud with a mighty, terrible noise, flame, smoke, and stink. It floats off over the sea, and the ship passes in calm. In De Nugis Curialium by Walter Mapp alleges that a relationship with a succubus cannot be entirely harmful at least not in the case of Gerbert of Orelai. When Gerbert meets a beautiful young maiden, she offers him money, knowledge of magic, and sex, if he but only grants her his faith. Her name is Meridiana. After gaining a fortune through his relationship with her, Gerbert's name changes to Pope Sylvester II, a title he gains in 999. Discovering he is about to die, Pope Sylvester II confesses his sins and gains penance, forgiven for consorting with a demon. According to Ludovico Maria Sinastrari, an Italian Franciscan priest in the 1600s, the devil either possesses a corpse to fornicate with another, or 
creates a new body from whatever materials are at hand. Some claim that as a succubus, a demon collects semen from a male victim. Then, the demon undergoes a change into an incubus and impregnates a woman with the collected semen. In the Maleus Maleficarum, Heinrich Kramer reflects. In the same way, they can also collect the seeds of other things for the working of their effects. In the begetting of such children, only the locomotion is to be attributed to devils, and not the actual begetting, which arises not from the power of the devil or of the body which he assumes, but from the virtue of him whose semen it was. Wherefore, the child is the son not of the devil, but of some man. But what are these children, born of a man's borrowed seed, cultivated by a demon? They are known as cambion. Born of an incubus and succubus, lacking a breath or pulse, until they reach seven years of age. One legendary cambion is Merlin, the wizard of Arthurian legend, himself the product of a mortal and an incubus. Another is the monstrous Caliban, the creature in Shakespeare's final play, The Tempest. He comes from the union of a witch and demon and is shackled by the sorcerer Prospero for his disobedience. One of the most enigmatic and terrifying cambions lives in the woods of New Jersey and starts life on a stormy night in 1735. A witch named Mother Leeds is pregnant with her 13th child, this one fathered by the devil himself. The newborn appears healthy and normal, but then changes before everyone's eyes. Cloven hooves, a goat's head, bat wings, and a forked tail. It becomes a devil. It screams and kills the midwife before making its way up the chimney and out into the night. Five years later, this Jersey devil is banished for 100 years by men of faith. It returns in 1890. Livestock is killed, and this red-eyed creature is seen throughout the countryside. Strange footprints are found in the snow and mud. Is the Jersey devil real? Sightings continue to this day. If you hear a shriek in the woods at night, you may do best to run. An alleged demon that becomes a cultural phenomenon is the legend of Spring-Heeled Jack. It is 1837 in South London. Mary Stevens walks through Clapham Common when a figure leaps out from an alley. It grabs her, tears at her clothes, kisses her, and touches her with claws. His hands are clammy, as if it were a corpse. Then, he disappears. The next night, this demonic figure jumps in front of a carriage. The coachman loses control and is injured. A nine-foot wall is no obstacle to this mysterious wraith, who jumps clear over it with a shrill laughter. The laugh of the ungodly. Even the Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Cowan, takes notice from an anonymous complaint. This strange man can allegedly change form and appear as a ghost, a bear, or even a devil. Then, on February 29, 1838, the demon, now very well known as spring Jack, attacks 18-year-old Jane Alsop when she answers her front door. He spouts blue flame while tearing at her with his claws. He takes off when her family arrives. Spring-Heeled Jack captures the public's imagination, making him the star of penny dreadfuls and lurid news stories throughout London. What was Spring-Heeled Jack? A case of mass hysteria? Or an actual demon? We will never know. The devil helped a Victorian novelist 
outsell all of her peers. Ironically, Marie Corelli and her novel The Sorrows of Satan is virtually unknown today. Born in 1855, Marie Corelli was originally known as Mary Mackay, the illegitimate daughter of a Scottish poet and his servant. She arrives on London's literary scene with her 1866 novel, A Romance of Two Worlds. Her work was loved throughout England, outselling contemporaries Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, H.G. Wells, and Rudyard Kipling combined. And she was admired by everyone, from the Royal Family of England to Winston Churchill. Mary herself, unfortunately, was off-putting in real life. Marie's own homosexuality and her romance with her partner, Bertha Viver, undoubtedly further separated her from society. Yet, her books continued to sell. Her novel, Barabbas, takes its own view of Christianity and the crucifixion, forcing her original publisher to reject it, claiming, I fear the effect on the public mind. In following up the success of Barabbas, Corelli features none other than the devil himself in The Sorrows of Satan. It remains a lost and largely forgotten masterpiece. When poor and destitute writer Jeffrey Tempest inherits $5 million and makes the acquaintance of Prince Lucio Rimanes, he thinks a life of materialism and fame is all he needs. Lucio makes Tempest an offer, his friendship in exchange for exposure to society. It is obvious to all but the atheistic Tempest that Lucio is none other than Satan. Corelli not only creates sympathy for the devil, but presents a unique twist on the legend of his fall. That Satan is seeking his own redemption through man, and each man or woman who falls to his temptation takes him one step further from returning to heaven. Lucio said, And so I say again, the sorrows of Satan, sorrows immeasurable as eternity itself, imagine them, to be shut out of heaven, to hear all through the unending aeons, the far-off voices of angels whom once he knew and loved, to be a wanderer among deserts of darkness, and to pine for the light celestial that was formerly as air and food to his being, and to know that man's folly, man's utter selfishness, man's cruelty, keep him thus exiled, an outcast from pardon and peace. Man's nobleness may lift the lost spirit almost within reach of his lost joys, but man's vileness drags him down again. Easy was the torture of Sisyphus compared with the torture of Satan. No wonder that he loathes mankind. Small blame to him if he seeks to destroy the puny tribe eternally. Little marvel that he grudges them their share of immortality. The Sorrows of Satan, like other successful novels, is adapted for the stage in 1896, much to the dismay of Corelli. Unofficial adaptations follow, even on Broadway in the United States. A British silent film is created in 1911, but is quickly squashed by Corelli. The 1917 adaptation, however, does get released. Another British production, licensed directly from the author, fails to materialize at the last minute. With Corelli's death in 1924, her estate is far more willing to part with the option on her work. Paramount taps legendary director D.W. Griffith to do a loyal adaptation of The Sorrows of Satan. It is to be his first film for the studio. Griffith grew up in squalor on a Kentucky farm. His father had been wounded while an officer in the Confederacy during the Civil War and died when D.W. was only 10. As D.W. comes of age in the late 1800s, it is into the advent of silent film. A job at Biograph as an actor 
and then director, leads him to experiment with the new storytelling medium. This shines through in his 1915 epic, Birth of a Nation. The film, unfortunately, paints African Americans in an unfavorable light as it follows the Civil War and subsequent birth of the Ku Klux Klan. It stands, however, as a technical achievement and cinema's first blockbuster feature-length film. He ironically follows this with intolerance, a plea for brotherhood amidst social strife. The Sorrows of Satan, however, is far from a statement for Griffith, and no more than an assignment from Paramount. The original intent of loyal adaptation of the novel is scrapped, for a more truncated version. But given that, he creates an atmospheric mood piece. His keen eye on lighting and editing is complemented by the fine performance of Adolphe Manjou as the devil. Screens on October 12, 1926. The New York Times calls it marvelously beautiful. Other reviewers and ticket sales are not so generous. The failure of Sorrows of Satan to generate the desired box office leaves Paramount to drop Griffith. He fades into relative obscurity until his death in 1948. Not all demons have material form. In instances like this, they possess a human body as an unwitting vessel, dominating a person's soul while committing evil through their own flesh and blood. To remove this demon, a priest conducts an exorcism to expel the evil spirit. The ancient Babylonians called upon their gods and goddesses to remove the demon from those damned with possession. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ uses his own power over demons as a sign of his being the Messiah. For Christ, granting the ability to exercise demons could be had by any of his disciples or any devout followers of Christianity. One soul, cursed to possession, Antoine Gay, has a shocking fate in store for him. Born in Latinay An, in France, Gay serves during the revolution and then makes a life as an exceptional carpenter. A devout Christian, it isn't until he was 46 
that he enters the monastery of the Abbey of Les Trappes de Aguibel. It is 1836. Gay is forced to leave the monastery as he is stricken with an odd nervous disorder. The next year, he is investigated by clergy for signs of possession. They visit him three times, and each one confirms the belief that Antoine Gay is truly possessed by demons. Gay reveals the secrets of others to the clergy and understands Latin perfectly, a language he has never been taught. But Gay is not the victim of a singular possession. Three demons inhabit his body. First is Isakeron, the most powerful of the three. Then, a demon of impurity known as the dog. Finally, the demon of avarice, who is known as the wolf. These three demons overtake Gay. His friends seek an exorcism at the Abbey of La Trappe, but the abbot refuses. Perhaps it is due to their being members of separate dioceses, or perhaps the abbot believes in a higher reason. Antoine Gay was a devout Christian. If God allows even him to be possessed, perhaps it is divine providence? Gay lives most of the rest of his life as a mental patient. He is left to his own devices the last 12 years of his life, even rejected by his own family. He lives poorly on a diet of bread and water and sleeps on a wooden plank. Iscaron is bent on keeping Gay from church when possible and always keeps him from confession. Iscaron refuses to let Gay confess until he himself is exorcised from the body. Gay, on his deathbed, is stricken dumb by the demon and denied his final confession. Antoine Gay dies on June 14th, 1871. He is 81 years old. It is January 1949 in Mount Rainier, Maryland. A 13-year-old boy, mourning the death of his Aunt Harriet, takes to using a Ouija board to contact her in the great beyond. What he gets is more than he bargained for. Strange things start to happen. Furniture moves on its own. There are footsteps, seemingly from nowhere. Objects fly through the air. A portrait of Jesus Christ is flung through the wall. Forty-eight witnesses swear to the strange behavior emanating from and about the board. Eventually, through the suggestion of a Lutheran minister, he is to be given an exorcism by a Roman Catholic priest. Five minutes in, the tied-down boy stabs the priest with a steel bedspring, enough to require stitches and end the rite. After returning home, the boy develops painful welts, leading his family to seek further help. It comes in the form of Father Walter Halloran, who has the boy, now referred to as Roland Doe, committed to a psychiatric ward for the exorcism. It takes three priests, Halloran, Father Bowden, and Reverend William Van Roo, to exorcise Roland Doe. He has an aversion to holy water and all things sacred. At one point, words such as evil and hell form on his body. Father Halloran's nose is broken in another of Roland's violent fits. But they persevere, and their victory is marked by a loud noise, one that reverberates throughout the hospital and marks the regained freedom of Roland. After more than two dozen exorcisms, Roland Doe is finally cured. The Doe exorcism becomes the basis of writer William Blatty's 1971 novel, The Exorcist. Given the success of the subsequent film adaptation, Roland Doe's Devil has been granted immortality in all of our minds and fear. The really great thing about a demon story is the sky's the limit with the amount of 
blood, terror, and darkness that you can add to your story. Uh, the demons come up from hell, and hell's a pretty bad place. So anybody that the demon inhabits is a big step up for that demon. And a lot of times they're sent by the devil himself to cause mayhem and mischief. So inside this body, surrounded by loved ones, this person begins to act in frightening ways that the family isn't quite ready to deal with. And they still love this person. So you've got a lot of fertile ground for blood, carnage, cool movie and horror stuff. In traditional horror movies, uh, usually took place medieval villages or on mountaintop castles in movies like Dracula and Frankenstein, which gave you a lot to look at as far as background goes, but didn't really connect with audiences, especially later in the 60s and 70s. Um, adding the element of demons, however, brought the horror home. You could have a demon possession taking place in a metropolitan or urban area, or even in the suburbs where you're supposed to be safe. If you're gonna talk about demon possession in modern times, then you definitely need to talk about the Amityville Horror. In 1974, Ronald DeFeo Jr. gunned down his entire family while they slept with a shotgun. Six months later, the Lutz family moved in to 112 Ocean Avenue on the south shore of Long Island. Some of the furniture the DeFeos furnished their house with was still inside the house. Less than a month later, the Lutz family left the house in the dead of night. A few weeks later, they began to pen the story of the Amityville horror. It detailed a swarm of flies, a demonic pig, and a roughed up priest they hired to bless the house when they moved in. It's the kind of house they don't build anymore. A relic of a time when the world wasn't in such a hurry, when there was still time for a little charm and elegance. It has stood empty for a long while. And at the price, it is a bargain. For a growing young family, it is almost too good to be true. What happened to them is an experience in terror you will never forget. And you will believe in the Amityville Horror. From the best-selling book that made millions believe in the unbelievable, the Amityville Horror. Demons are scary because they take the bodies of those we love and turn them against us in horrible, ghoulish ways. And uh, one genre of film that captured this perfectly is the Italian horror movies, or Giallo. The films Demon and Demon 2 illustrate what it would be like if people were possessed by these schools and driven to commit acts of horror. The difference again between these modern horror stories and the classics is that the Italian horror movie presents the narrative of terror in a dreamlike fashion rather than a classic narrative. Often the events and scenes don't really make linear sense. They more trigger emotional effects. We've seen Satan and have learned of the terror his demonic horde can unleash on humanity. What of those who dance with Satan and his minions, who damn themselves in life, forsaking heaven for a life of dark power?
What of witches and witchcraft? Next, we will enter the world of black magic, covens, and the followers of Satan and all things evil. Their ties to the dark arts make them the most sinister monsters among us. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.